hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask could they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. Um, First of all, I just want to say that I hope everyone is just staying safe, that you and your family, that you're well. Um, We're in some, some very difficult dark times. And um, I'm just trusting that you're having good conversations, you're connecting with good people, and you're getting a chance to center yourselves and refocus during this time. Um, Each week, I work to bring you um, great conversations to help you think differently about your world, differently about race relations, and differently about your role in those race relations, from understanding them to doing what you can to make things better. Today's conversation is uh, is particularly important to me because a dear brother, one of my best friends in the world, is back on the show with me. Um, He actually appeared in episode 23 when we were talking about race relations. Um, This was back in July of 18. So it's been about about two years since he's been on Black Like Me. And we just want to talk about some of the things that are going on in this country uh, for Asian Americans. And, um, and just have an honest dialogue, you know, from an Asian American brother, Korean American brother to an African American brother, what's going on? How do we see it? How are our communities responding? How should they be responding? And I think you're gonna find this um, really interesting. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So, hey, Peter Ahn, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well, thanks for having me on the show. Sure, Great man, it's good to have you back. So Peter, you're the, you're the um, senior pastor of, of Metro Community Church um, in Inglewood, New Jersey, a vibrant, multicultural church. Um, and I, I mean that in every sense of the word, multicultural, multi-ethnic. I've been there. I've preached there a number of times. It's really good to have you back here, brother. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. You, you and Jenny and the kids, you guys are doing well? We're doing really well. Uh, we're having family night. And thanks to you, we're watching This Is Us every night. And it is <laughs> I told you. Oh, I cannot believe how good that show is. Dude, and, I told uh, you, if you is. download it and don't like it, I'll pay you for the episodes. Yeah, exactly. But you're enjoying it? It's amazing. We are binge watching about three episodes <laughs> a night at least. <laughs> I and, know, uh, I know. There's been a couple of times where I have to look away and tear up a little bit because it's so powerful. But uh, what a show, really. What I a mean, show. Man, I know. I'm like, come on. No, come on, don't do it, Randall. Randall, don't do it. <laughs> I know, don't exactly. Be strong, Randall. I, my goodness. I just, I love it. I love it. One day we need to just have a conversation about that, buddy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Listen, man, before we get into our conversation, um, I want to open up with some, with some black icebreakers. You know, you got I, it. I, I, I thought about not doing these, but during these times, I think people still need to laugh. And humor is a part of how I navigate um, the world. And so I'll just start off by just asking, um, growing up or even now, um, what's your preference, um, if any, between grits or cream of wheat? Uh, I would probably go with cream of wheat. <laughs> Okay, we're having some technical difficulty right now. We're going to have to postpone this show. Well, the you answer I should have said, said is great. You, you just said Black Korean relations <laughs> back, I don't know, maybe like 75. You know, now that you, I think that's right, because we gave you grits at our house and you didn't like them. That's because you didn't put butter and sugar on them. Yes. You let Jackie, yes. and a part of my family that's from Alabama, yes, yes. talk you into salt and pepper. Actually, you that's tried right. them both and you like salt I, better, I think. Well, no, I actually like yours too, because I like the sweeter one better, so for sure. <laughs> we put you right in the middle of a black, yeah. black family fight, dude. We're like, Peter, which one do you like? You're like, oh man, I'm just trying to. <laughs> man, hey, when it comes to soul food and collard greens, what mm-hmm. do you prefer, turnips, mustards, or collards? Collards. Collard greens. So you had yeah. collard greens before. Oh, I've had it with, at your house. The best I've ever had <laughs> is at your house. Your mother-in-law is amazing when she makes those. And then the, uh, the mac and cheese with it. Mm, oh, my you, goodness. It is amazing. Man, the she best makes, collard greens i ever had. Co- man, she made, she made some collard greens last night. Oh, I saw man. her pull them out the, you know, in the morning. She cooked them. And um, so, man, that, yes, yes. I, I tell all my friends about it, about how good the, uh, the collard greens are uh, that your mother-in-law makes. It's, it's literally, man, yeah, I think about yeah. it all the time. Man, she, yeah, she's a great Southern cook. And she teach me a little bit about, about her secrets, man. That is, man, that is, that is so wild. 
Hey, listen, when you were growing up, did you have play cousins that you didn't realize were, were you know, that they weren't real cousins until maybe adulthood? Well, well, we didn't have any cousins, any real cousins. Uh, my mom was the only child. She had a half brother, but she lost contact with him years mm -hmm. ago. My father's from North Korea. He defected. So he lost contact uh, with his family during the Korean War. So we didn't have any relatives growing up. So anyone that was close to my parents and they had kids and we connected relatively, you know, uh, mm -hmm. frequently, we would call them our cousins. And okay. uh, we would have so much cousin envy growing up because really? you know, all of like our friends and they had cousins to hang out with, but we didn't have any real cousins. So, yeah. I got you. That's cool. That's cool. Um, I'm wondering if Korean American culture is similar to black culture in this regard, at least in your family. Like we would use homemade remedies like Vicks Vapor Rub is supposed to be used externally <laughs> on your chest. My grandmother would like put that stuff in your mouth and your throat. She'd be like, open your mouth. Oh, oh, oh. You like, like, grandma, I don't think grandma, I don't think you're supposed to ingest this. Shut up, boy. <laughs> yeah. Got all that education and don't know any mother. That's with. right. That's right. So I can still taste, you know, Vicks Vapor Rub. Um, did your mom, people ever put Vicks Vapor Rub in your mouth? Or, or, or? My mom <laughs> never did. <laughs> she never did. She, uh, no, she, whenever I got sick, she'd make me breathe into a humidifier all night. That's basically all she made me do. Well, we put that on too with the Vicks Vapor. Right? Yeah. So you put the, you put she, that little She never put the Vicks on. Vapor on there. Nobody ever told her about that, but no. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh man. Hey, listen, did you, um, did you get syllable spankings when you were growing up? Do you know what a syllable spanking no, is? No, no, no. Syllable spanking in the black community is when your, <laughs> your mom gives you a lecture while she's whooping that ass. <laughs> And so she'll tell you, hey, Alex, stop playing out there on, you know, around the dinner table. Alex, stop playing on that chair. Stop leaning back. Then the chair falls back. Boom. Give me something to beat you with. Didn't I tell you to stop playing in the kitchen? Didn't I, huh? Didn't I, didn't I, huh? Didn't I, huh? Didn't I, didn't I, huh? And so we didn't necessarily call them syllable whoopings. But when I talked to black people about it, they just started laughing. They're like, that's what it's called? Of course my mom did that. So I'm curious when you would when you would get it from your parents would they would it, would they just be silent or would it be sort of um this this syllable? Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it it wasn't as tamed as the way I think the way you guys <laughs> when I got hit by my parents, particularly my father, uh, it wasn't it wasn't very nice. It was uh it was there was a lot of anger involved in it, gotcha. and so uh, it was quite it was quite scary for me at least. No, so, yeah. So, oh, I got you. So, so and there were a lot of derogatory been, statements that was uh, yelled at me when I got. Got hit. you. So it might not have been <laughs> syllable. It might have been word spanking. Oh. You, might, you probably got oh, yeah. a paragraph spanking. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness, man, Peter, man, it's just good, just good, good to laugh. Hey, one more. You ever been yeah. to a black? You ever got your hair cut in a black barber shop? Uh, no, you've tried to get me to go a couple of times, and I was just okay. like, "Oh man, I don't know if I could do that." Okay, <laughs> you, you wanted me to get the high and tight. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna get you faded up when you come. <laughs> when you come back to Madison. <laughs> no, 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 no. You take me to your joints. I'm gonna take you to my <laughs> be in the black community. And what's so funny is when black cosmo cosmetologists and, and barbers go to school, they have to learn to do everything. So yeah. they've got to be able to do perms, frosting, yeah. tips, twists, all this kind of stuff. So they got you, man. All right. And, all and when right. I go, so the barbershop I go, that's where a lot of the um, the athletes go. So you see like UW, University of Wisconsin basketball players. Oh, I've been to that barbershop. You've that's taken right. me there one that's time right. and I've watched you get haircuts there. Yeah. <laughs> so we yeah. have to talk about that. Okay, okay. So listen, man, we, we have, um, we've been friends for, for years, man. It seems like we've been friends all our, you know, all our lives. And we're really, it feels more like a brother. Um, brotherhood than does than it does uh mere friendship you know my daughter calls you uncle peter your kids call me uncle alex we stayed each other's homes um interestingly my first time to africa was with you my first three trips to africa was with you um there's a lot of shame around the continent of africa and i feel like you were you were really a tool in helping me um to understand and to embrace the beauty of africa it was south africa i have an understanding that i'm from west africa and i know yeah. where i'm from but you opened that door um, for me to be able to do that. Interestingly enough, a number of years ago, I invited you to come with me to Korea. Mm -hmm. It was my second trip, I believe. Yeah, it was my second trip to Korea. Yeah. And you didn't really want to go for maybe similar reasons. I'll ask you to explain in just a moment. But it was interesting for me to encourage you to go to your motherland. Because I said, look, yeah. Peter, you took me to my motherland. There's some reason why you probably don't want to go. Um, and I just felt like we can't function well in America if there's some type of shame about 
yeah. where we come from. And I just felt like it was really important to do that. Well, man, you've been back time and time again. You've fallen in love with it. I mean, you were born in Korea. You actually came yeah. to the U.S. when you were young because you were sick and your parents brought you when you were a baby, an infant, um, for medical treatment. But it, I think just, I'll just start off by just saying the irony of we have been to each other's yeah motherlands and that not, not a lot of friends get to say they've had that experience particularly mm -hmm. asian american and african american yeah no for sure and I, I would i would simply say that uh for uh you're the really the reason why um i had to deal with this shame that i've had uh growing up as a kid here in northern new jersey there was a lot of shame in being korean and you know kids would make fun of me say horrible things to me at school yeah. and all that stuff and there was just this deep sense of shame that i had in being korean so i just really didn't have any desire to go back to korea or even visit and really it's been our our friendship where you have really challenged me and helped me to see of the shame that has been there in my life uh, mm -hmm. of being korean how important it is for me to go back to the motherland and and keep learning and and really embrace and love the fact that God created me Korean. And so that first time we went, that was many years ago. It was the second, I've gone to Korea when I was a sophomore in college, the first time I ever went. Sure. And, and the second time I went was with you and it really opened wow. up this doorway for me to see and really fall a little bit, start the process of it. But then it was really uh, my sabbatical about six, seven years ago. And I was mm -hmm. talking to you, we were at Times Square just hanging out and I was talking to you about like potential thing on my sabbatical. And you just said, it's really important that I go out there and spend my sabbatical in Korea and really retrace my roots, go back to the town that I was born in, try to visit the hospital, see if there's a birth certificate, go visit the home that I grew up in as a little guy. I only lived in Korea for three months before I came over here. Sure. And, uh, and so I actually did all of that. I got to meet a great wow. uncle that I didn't wow. know. Um, wow. Never met. My mom hadn't met him in over 40 years. And I uh, hadn't seen him and we were able to connect that and I was able to connect with him and learn a lot about my mom um, just through him by, by, by hearing about my mother's mother and how she lived her life. And, uh, and just retracing the roots, my uncle took me to the hospital that I was born in. It's a major hospital now. Back then it was just this tiny little place and uh, went there, went to the house that we lived in for the first few months. I mean, it wow. just, wow, after Peter. that sabbatical, I just... I was so thankful that God created me Korean. And I really have you to thank for that because if you didn't tell me to do this and to apply for some grants that I was reluctant to apply for to do this so that my family and I could enjoy this, it was such an amazing time where when we came back about a year or two later, Christina said that she wanted, and this is a smaller scale, but she said that she wanted to go with the family to LA because that's where she was born. And she wanted to retrace her roots. You That's know, beautiful. and stuff like that. And so we went back, but part of the reason why she wanted to do that was because she saw what I experienced when I was in Korea. She was a part of that. So it kind of was like, she, now she wanted to go out to LA and see what hospital she was born at, where we live, I love and all it. that stuff. And it was just really cool. So I really have you to thank for that. Man, Peter. You know what? I actually forgot that conversation. So thank you for yeah. reminding me. I mean, as soon as you mentioned it, it came, you know, yeah. the memory started flooding back. And I think this is all a perfect setup and segue in just a few minutes to our main discussion today. But as black people, we lost so much in the transatlantic slave yeah. trade. We lost our families, our culture, our land, our pride, our legacy. And we tried our best to regain that, to recapture that um, in the US. But every time we did it, we were told it was ugly, it was dumb. Um, even in Christian circles, you and I are both, are both mm -hmm. Christian pastors, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're still uncouth. Our worship is, is um, too lively, too long, too loud. Our singing is not theological enough. Our preaching is too allegorical. So even to this day, how we approach life, how we approach God, yeah. how we approach the world is scrutinized by the broader white dominant community. And there was a scene in, in Alex Haley's Roots. It came out when I was 13. It came out when I was in eighth grade and I was in middle school. And there's a scene where LeVar Burton was being beaten by um, um, Vic, Damone, I think it's like, was it Vic Damone? One of the Vic characters. Um, mm -hmm. But um, he was a slave master and he was, um, he was beating him. He was trying to make him say that his name was Toby and not Kunta. Um, and as a kid, we didn't get that. And I, gotta, I have to even admit, it, it, it angered me a lot um, because it's like that, that, that miniseries transported me back into a part of history I didn't know about. And um, 
But that scene has haunted me because really he beat him within, a, within an inch of his life to finally said, Toby. And as, this, as we fast forward it yeah. um, since 77, I realized that's really the struggle in America to let go of your name, your culture, the stuff that makes you distinct and innately strong, that connects you to the land, to God and to each other. That there's been this struggle to try to pull that from us. And black people have just held on to it. We like our big knit, our lips. We like our wide nose. We like our big butts. We like, you know, and, and that's not the only thing that epitomizes sure. blackness, but we're not ashamed of the things that, that um, that's the antithesis of what you see in culture, our music, our singing, our food, our jokes, you know, all of those things. And so I think one of the things that we, and it has not, after 400 years of slavery, it has not been beaten out of us. That's why I love the icebreakers because a black person can be from South Carolina and California mm. and they'll say, oh yeah, I got syllable whooping. We didn't call it that, but oh yeah. Oh yeah, my grandmother used to wear, you know, um, um, you know, what, what do you call it? A duster or, or a nightgown. Like we have these experiences because the, the proof that we were not defeated is that we could still create culture. Yeah. That defeated people cannot create culture. And if, Asian Americans, um, Latinos, African Americans lose our culture, ignore our culture, then it's proof that we have been broken. Yeah. And then we don't have that to pass on to our next folks. And so I think that one of the things that African Americans can bring to the table is answering the question, has it been worth it to not fully assimilate to American culture? Yeah. Has it been worth it to say, no, my name is Kunta, it's not Toby, it's Kunta, it's not Toby even though he was beaten for it, um, it, just, it just sort of epitomizes what's going on. So you and I were talking last week about what's happening with my Asian American brothers and sisters. And first of all, let me just say, because I don't want our listeners to get um, comfortable with Asian American, because what I've learned from you and others is that there's no such thing as just Asian yeah. American, because Filipino culture, so much different than Japanese culture, which is so much different than Korean culture. Heck, there's a difference between North Korean culture and South Korean culture. And so if we slip into that, it's for the, you know, it's just for the lack of better vernacular, but people of Asian descent yeah. are experiencing a resurgence of hatred, uh, racism in light of COVID-19 that people have probably not experienced in a long time. I know you well enough to know that there are things you experienced as a kid in a predominantly um, white, largely Italian yep. um, and Jewish community. Um, I know you talked a lot about the Italian um, 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 emphasis in your schools, but now doctors, professors, pastors are feeling this group disdain just because of how you look. And folks of Asian descent have not experienced that that way in a long time. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing, what you're sensing, what this is feeling like in this day and time for folks of Asian descent? You know, as we talked about this last week, I, I thought about it even a bit more, but um... It's it's really uncharted territory, I think, for a lot of us. I mean, I think me growing up as a kid, being made fun of and stuff by white folks, I mean, it was, you know, it was there. I got bullied and things like that. But I think what, what we're experiencing now, because when we immigrated to this country, I think there's just this history of um, our goal was to be white. That, wow. was our, our, that was our goal. Wow. When you think about Korean history, think about this for a second. We... The, the division of North and South came about through America. Koreans didn't have a say in this. We, you know, Koreans, there's a movie called Ode to Father and, and, and it addresses us so clearly. They thought once the war was over, you know, the country will be back to normal. But when the war was over, there was a decision that was made that there would be a North Korea and a South Korea. And America played a big role in that. And as a result of it, you know, America played a prominent role in South Korea and how Korea is what it is today. And so, you know, just by having, you know, military back, you know, back in those days and, and Korean people seeing white people come, I mean, there is a sense of um, idolizing, uh, looking at the American features with the eyes and things like that and saying, we want to look like that. So Korea is the number one plastic surgery capital in the world. Um, Are you everyone, serious? Yeah, everyone gets surgery, uh, probably even men now. But uh, the idea that when a child is born, uh, the parents are praying that they would have big eyes and the flap that you guys all have when you're born. Koreans don't have that. So we have the smaller eyes. And so there is this natural idolization of Western culture, particularly American culture that we sort of, that's sort of like foundational for us. 
And so when we immigrated to this country, our goal was, you know, study hard, do the best we can and do whatever we can to try to be white um, and try to get to that level because that is the level that we need to get to. And so, you know, for most parts, for a lot of Korean Americans, we've done very hard in trying to do the best we can to succeed and, and so forth. So I think what we are experiencing now is something so uncommon for us because I think in some ways that our community has believed that, you know what, we have achieved the education, the socioeconomic level. Right. So I think it's okay. We are actually experiencing some of the benefits of being like white, you know, because we have the status of being white in some levels because of our yeah. education and our finances and stuff like that. But what's happening now because of COVID-19 and being discriminated upon, it doesn't matter uh, what school you went to, what you do for work. It doesn't. Um, we're being, yeah, we're being violently um, uh, uh, beaten for the way we look um, and discriminated upon just by the color of our skin. And so in some ways, it's so tragic and it weighs heavier within my heart and we have to do something about it. But at the same time, I hope that for this season for Asian Americans, particularly Korean Americans, I can only speak for our people, is that it would help us to build some solidarity with the African American community and understanding that African Americans have a history in this country, even today, that they experience not only discrimination, but they've experienced violence just because of the color of their skin. Sure. Wow, Peter, that's, man, what you, what you just laid out is, is really powerful. You know, you and I, uh, I shared an article with you a few weeks ago because I, I use it in a, in a sermon. Um, because people, and again, to my white listeners, the um, folks who are part of the Black Like Me podcast family, you might think that we all just sort of named ourselves, that Europeans said, we're white, and then people from the continent of Africa said, we're black. Folks from Latin America said, we're, we're brown. Folks from Asia said, we're yellow. That was the designation by white people. Yep, it was. In fact, in a lot of ways, um, because it, it, it's not really related to fully to pigmentation of skin, that Asian Americans were considered white or close to white. When Asian Americans decided to not play um, or lean into the propaganda that the U.S. and Europe, um, that they were exerting, um, some of the power grabs they were going after, when, when, when China, Japan, Korea started saying, no, we're going to, you know, we're going to create our own economies. We're, we're, going to, we're going to become our own super world power. We're, we don't need to sync up with you. The white folks said, ah, oh, okay, you're yellow. Mm-hmm. You're not quite black. You're not, you know, you're not as bad as black, but you're not, you'll never be white. But we created this, this designation. So I want white people to understand. Asian folks did not say, look at my skin. I'm yellow. Yeah. That's not what they said. I am not black. Yep. Peter is not yellow. Yep. Our pigmentation, uh, you know, there's some of us on that spectrum. But that was a designation that white folks set up to create this, this, this hierarchy. Right. This, um, um, and then they could pit us against each other. Right. And they used the word model minority. They exactly. gave us that word so that they could pit us against black people. Said, right. Why because, can't it be like these model minorities right. here? Because yeah. folks, folks of Asian descent didn't say that. They didn't look at the nope. other groups and say, you know what? We're nope. the model minorities. Nope. It was sort of like... Um, it was sort of like a parent or boss bringing three different employees um, um, into a room and saying, you know, that group over there, they're trying to take over the break room. Or that group over there, they want to take care of some of your rights. And so they really pitted us against each other. So calling you the model minority, folks of Asian descent felt that they could work their way out of yellowness into whiteness to be accepted. Uh, but it kept us from really working together and strategizing together because if you all of Asian descent weren't going to help the Europeans mm-hmm. and the Americans to become an even greater superpower. They were going to make darn sure that you were not going to pass them up. So then they put you into this fight with other folks. Um, and another thing people, people don't know, Peter, is that after the Emancipation Proclamation, some of the same slave ships that brought Black people here from Africa sailed to Asia to bring Asian Americans, I think largely Chinese, to bring them here to live in some of the same plantation homes Mm -hmm. to do, to, to, to do the work. So once, you know, black people were freed and not because all white people loved us, it was to keep the country together so that it could be a superpower. America then just found another group of slaves to replace them. And so, you know, how does America go from seeing you all as replacement slaves to modern minorities, unless it benefited America financially? 
Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting because years ago, you know, my uncle uh, from Korea, I just, I, I naturally thought our greatest uh, uh, people group that we don't like uh, is Japanese just because mm-hmm. of our history right. and what they've done to us and so forth. And so I just asked him one time, I just said, Hey, um, so, you know, like just by and large, do you not like the Japanese the most out of all the different groups out there? Who, which ethnic group or which people group or which country do you hate the most? And he just said, uh, it's not Japanese. He said, uh, it's Americans. And, and I was shocked by that. And I said, but why? Like, I mean, you know, we help defeat the war and, and uh, you know, and America has done a lot for Korea and so forth. And I think he acknowledged that to some degree, but he said, no, at the end of the day, uh, our country is divided because of the Americans. And we can now Ouch. get our country back and the way it is because there's too much interest for America to have a base in South Korea. Because after World War II, you know, the whole thing with Japan, what happened in Pearl Harbor and stuff. And so it was important for America to have a base in Asia and that's South Korea, you know, and stuff. And so, you know, he, and it's, it's a sentiment that uh, a, a South Korean will definitely agree with and they feel, particularly the older generation, like my uncle, who's in his, you know, uh, late 50s, early 60s now, um, it's, it's that generation that really understands the realities of that because they were alive during that time or, or wow. they were just alive just a little after that time and they saw their parents and, and, and see how much pain that their parents had because they couldn't go meet their brothers and sisters anymore because it's no longer their country. Uh, North Korea is no longer a part where they can go back and be a part of and, uh, and go see their family. And they were just divided and they no longer can go back to their country. Everyone thought in Korea when the war was over, then they can go see their family again because there was such a, a migration to the South because the North was such a hard place where the war was really hard up there. And a lot of the North Koreans came down to South Korea during that time uh, before it was even divided uh, for, for safe pass- passageway. And when the war was over, everyone just thought, okay, we're gonna go back now. But uh, when the war was over, uh, they found out on the news saying uh, through a radio uh, that no longer is Korea unified. It's now divided to North and South. And so the North will be communist and the South will be, you know, uh, a democratic uh, country like America. So any event. So it was something that I learned and I just realized, wow, that it was it was shocking for me because as a Korean American growing up in this country my whole life, I didn't understand the depth of disdain that Koreans, South Koreans had, uh, particularly the older generation had for, um, for America. Wow. And yeah. we don't learn that. We don't learn that in school. That's not a, a part of the history I learned. And it sounds like it wasn't part of the history you learned. No. And history looking back is, is really important. Yeah. I mean, I know um, one of the benefits, one of the many benefits of our, of our friendship, of our brotherhood, is that we help people from our ethnic group understand other ethnic groups better. And so, um, when I, when I want to talk to African-American people about some of the struggles of Asian Americans, their perception is they don't like us. They think they're better than us. They've been, they've been whitewashed and they've been taught to look down on us. So that's a strong sentiment that, um, African-Americans did a lot in terms of marching, mm-hmm. bloodshed, being bitten by dogs, urine thrown on us oh, yeah. <clears throat> to open the doors for ethnic groups really um, to not only create legislation or to, to spur on legislation that would help even immigrant families coming, um, even from, from Asia, you know, the, um, immigration acts that have changed so that people could actually come with resources from mm-hmm. Asia and start businesses and bring wealth and not come over as slaves or indentured, serv- indentured servants. There's not broad knowledge of that because I think if more Asian Americans knew that, people of Asian descent, I think we connect more, but to not know that yeah. history, um, to be told you're the model, you're the model minority. What younger sibling who's being told, let's say, an older sibling, why can't you be like them? Why can't you be smarter like your brother? Why can't you work hard? You know, some of us have grown up in homes where that stuff is said. Mm. Those things have been taught, so that some folks of Asian descent are taught to look down on us. Oh yeah, and and we're taught. Um, that we're going to be disrespected in their stores, in their shops. Yep. I mean, that's, that's played out in Spike Lee's yep. Do the Right Thing. Yep. Yep. Just some of the relationships that are, that are in there. So really, I need folks who are white listening to this to understand we've been pitted against each other. Because, you know, Peter and I have both talked about this in the 1960s. If you Google, you can find signs of Asian Americans, like with clenched fists, like, like a black power sign with um, uh, a symbol saying, with a sign saying, um, 
um, Asian peril stands with black power. I didn't know this. I was shocked to find this, that there was a time where we stood in greater solidarity. Yeah. But if you think about it, if you have people of Asian descent, African descent, you know, um, you know, from, from, from Latin America, folks from, from Mexico, you know, from South America, if we're standing together, Native American, if we're standing together in solidarity, you know, the powers that be begin to think, oh crap, this has changed because the truth of the matter is, Peter, we know this, we're called minority in this country. Yeah. We're not minority in, in the world. Yeah, I mean, white people make up a very small percentage right. of the world population, yet we're made to feel like we're, like even the words that we're called minorities, ethnic minorities, cultural minorities, and the bulk of the world look like you or me yeah. or someone from Latin America. Yeah, no, it's the truth. So we, yeah. got, we got to get back. That history is really, is really important. Hey, this is Eli Steenlich, the engineer and editor of the Black Like Me podcast. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about Patreon, our service that lets you support the show. And we know that you all love the show and listen every week. And so if you want to keep supporting what we do, make sure you go to patreon.com slash black like me. It's never been easier to give to the show and support it. We have a new $2 level which is cheaper than a cup of coffee. So go ahead and go over to the website, patreon.com slash black like me, and make sure you keep the content coming. And we've already started to do some new things that we're excited about because of the Patreon supporters that we have. So we're going to take you back to the show and back to Dr. G. But thanks for listening. Have you experienced any of this, um, this, this I, won't, I won't even call it new, Peter. I refuse to call it new racism. Because I think that there are things that folks have been, white folks have been wanting to say to black people. Mm. They've been wanting to say it before Trump. Trump, listen, he's done enough to have fingers pointed at him. But you can't blame Trump for everything. He might have given people license, but he can't make you say what you don't want to say. In one of my episodes of this podcast, I mentioned that he was sort of a ventriloquist dummy. But mm. he's sitting on America's lap saying what America's mm. been wanting. He's mouthing what America's been wanting to say. So this response, of, you know, just over COVID-19, um, I recently saw this, this article that's circulating online, a powerful statement by people of Asian descent about um, how they, they, they are standing against these, these incidents. They're, they're calling out, calling it out, and they're asking people to stand in solidarity. I posted it. I signed it yep. because it's the right thing to do. But are you personally talking with people who are, who are describing things that are happening to them or things that are being said to them? Are your kids experiencing it, your wife, your church members? What do yeah, you see in terms uh, of this? I, I would say some church members, uh, some folks who are working uh, in New York um, have experienced some. Uh, I know some of my some of our church members have friends who are actually uh, physically beaten. Uh, because, are you serious? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was uh, it was an unfortunate reality of, of what's kind of happening. And, you know, it, I, I think the heart the hard part of it all is that. Uh, you know, this is the, the violence that's happening towards uh, towards Asians during this time isn't just I mean, the majority of it, I think, c- comes from the white community, but actually comes from the minority community, too. And really- uh, yeah, the black and the brown community, you know, have have also participated in this. And that, I don't know if it's just because they think, you know, uh, of, of, you know, thinking that, well, because the COVID-19 originated in China. But maybe there's other stuff there in the past as well, and so I, I think I think right now Asians, by and large, are um, are definitely upset. They're angry, and they're not able to get to a place where they're able to see, okay, what what really are the next steps to get better and to stand for ourselves and to fight for this. And so, um, and I think that this is why it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to really sort of connect with the black community and learn, because I think we can learn so much. From, uh, from the black community and how we can take a stand and fight for our people and uh, so that this thing doesn't happen. Sure, but yep. there's also some work within groups that are, that are, that are Asian, that descendants of Asia. For, for example, someone from China does not have the same lived experience, the same American experience, yep. the same world experience as someone from Korea. Yep. And so I would imagine that within what we call the Asian American groups, there's got to be some discussion, like like Black Americans. We might be Southern, East Coast. You know, we might say, "Well, I got some Creole in me. I got some yeah, Native American yeah, yeah, in me." Yeah. But we're Black, and we might have uh, geographical differences. 
But we're not saying to each other, well, I'm from Guinea-Bissau, or I'm from Senegal, I'm from Ghana. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're black. Like, we see each other in the street. Well, not, nah, yeah. depending on where you're from, you'll speak. Yeah. Um, is there a discussion among Asian American groups about how the various groups need to do any work or any discussion among themselves to, to have a greater appreciation um, or an understanding of how maybe America has caused you all to be separate as people groups? Yeah, no, as far as I know, uh, I, don't, I don't think there is, um, but there might be particularly. Uh, I'm not sure. I think right now the discussion really is how do we come together as Asian Americans in this country sure. and, uh, and stand against what's happening um, uh, to us as, as people. And, uh, and so the petition that you signed, which I'm so grateful for, and that a lot oh, of other people signed, was really a petition so that Asian Americans can, can uh, you know, um, could have a voice and uh, people could hear and listen and come together and support us during this time. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And one of the things I want to say, um, you know, to my Black community, to my Black listeners, <clears throat> is um, this is a time to lean in, to look at what's going on, and to make sure that we're not gloating because it can be very tempting to do so. Because mm. if I'm getting my butt whooped, and I feel like historically, my Korean American brothers and sisters just laughed or just said, that's because you're criminal, then when it's your time for your whooping, um, I'm not necessarily motivated to jump in and help you fight. I think we have to realize that these yeah. things, these times are so dangerous and so ugly that we have to find our way out of the past and find out how to really work together. And so um, I'm leaning in because I don't want to, I don't want, I'm not in a position of gloating and saying, you know, hey, that's what you get. Cause I don't, that's not how I really work. However, what I do think about is if somehow folks of Asian descent understood or learned or relearned US history so that they formed new thoughts about history before their minds were whitewashed, by white history and revisionist history, it would cause us to look at each other much differently. Like there's this article, um, I'm gonna see if I can find it for just, for just a moment, but it's written by um, a scholar, her name is Evelyn Chin. Mm -hmm. and it's entitled um, The Black Power Movement and the Asian American Movement. Um, and I'll link this in this episode. I sent it to you today, Peter, but she yeah, says I thought. at the end, <clears throat> in a time where Asians still find themselves looking down upon Blacks and are often pitted, and this is, this is written a while ago, this is not written in light of COVID-19, um, and are often pitted against one another in stereotypes like model minority, it is crucial to remember that it is not always as easy as it looks to determine what is the truth. Yeah. So many histories are shared between people who often feel that they lack anything in common. In determining Asian American identity, one must have a sense of history, but only by knowing where we have been will we be able to understand where we are and where we're going. And it is, it is impossible to look upon history as an isolated set of circumstances that apply to one ethnic group. She goes on to be able to say, as the Asian American socials, I mean, Asian American civil rights movement evolved during civil rights, it was largely shaped by Malcolm X, by Martin Luther King Jr. Well, I wasn't taught that growing up, and I'm sure you weren't either. Yep. And so when we begin to realize that the liberties that folks from Asia have experienced, white women who benefited greatly because of civil rights, yeah. when these groups begin to look back and say, thank you, we don't understand you, but we didn't know what you did and that it had a far-reaching impact. Because I think with an acknowledgement of that, then it helps us to lean in together. We, I yes, mean, we don't, need, we don't need restitution. We don't need you know, yeah. these different groups to give us anything back. But I think if we don't know the history, yes. we don't realize that we really are linked, that even the rise of the Asian civil rights movement was rooted in, in the black, black movement. Women's suffrage movement was influenced yeah. by civil rights and the rights of uh, formerly in, uh, enslaved individuals. It gave birth and rise to the suffrage movement so, so the liberties that so many Americans experience have been forged on the shoulders and the backs and the lives and the breasts and the wombs of black people. Yes. And we just feel screwed by the world. And so I think as others begin to lean in to understand not just black history, yep. but where did the Asian American civil rights movement begin and acknowledge those black leaders um, who inspired those Asian American leaders. I just, that piece was written by Chen, I believe that she's, um, Chinese American, but she quotes uh, someone who's Japanese American. 
um, we begin to build this solidarity together. That's and I right. think that's the moment. The moment is to, to realize that we can't let white people or any groups come after one group because of how they look or the color of their skin because we'll be next. And we've, and we've right. seen that. That's right. And so um, although it's not okay for anyone to beat on others, shame on people of color who join in on that violence and perpetrating that, that violence against folks who are of Asian descent and um, shame on people who feel that their hard work has moved them out of minority status because what we're hearing is what white folks have thought. It's just that now Asian Americans, African Americans are really a threat to the economic stability That's right. of so many other white folks that we're gonna see a resurgence of violence like we've seen and pitting us against each other. We've gotta be smart and we've gotta, we've gotta, we've, we've gotta outwit them and find a way to work together. And, and, you know, I think what's really important, if there are any Asian listeners, uh, and I'm sure there are, and even the, mm-hmm. even, even the Black listeners as well, is that I think, I think the, the solidarity is, is, is a real key component in what you just said. But I think what's the most important thing is that we really need to, I think the first step is to start building uh, authentic friendships. Right. Uh, if, if you're Asian listening right now, you need to start looking into forging a real honest, authentic relationship with a Black person. And vice versa. And right. uh, I, my, my, you know, because when there's love in a relationship, uh, it's very different than it becomes a lot more personal. So when you told me that what happened to you at your church parking lot by the officer, uh, right. I mean, that just infuriated me. And it did. Part, part of that is because we're friends. Uh, and we, you know, we've traveled the world together and I love you, you love me. And we have this right. friendship and this bond. And it wasn't just, oh, this is what's happening to a black man. This is, this is what's happening to my dear brother, you know, and, uh, and stuff. And so I just think that kind of friendship and that intentionality then really um, uh, uh, what it does, that it bridges the gap that was created, I think, by, you know, by white Americans to kind of pit us against each other. And there's this division now between us. And then when we hear what's happening to our people group, this, that, that distance doesn't allow us to, to really be connected to what's happening to the stories that we're hearing. But when there is a face that we know that we love and we have a relationship with, then it's very different. Then it's like, oh, well, those are my people too. And right. I can't just sit back and just let it happen. I, I, gotta, I gotta stand up and fight because this is somebody I love dearly. And so Definitely. I think Definitely. step one is let's start building some real friendships. Um, if you're Asian with the black community, if you're black with the Asian community, and let's start getting to know each other. Because like, as you and I, we joke around, there's so many similarities between black and korean culture and even oh yes black uh, christian culture and korean christian culture i mean it's just there's so many similarities and it's just so beautiful to see that you know and stuff and um anyway yeah so. yeah and you don't and you don't know that if you don't lean in you just Absolutely. assume that there are differences i remember um i was an urbana missions conference speaker back in the yeah. um, uh, late 90s and I was invited to Cornell University to um, Korean Bible study. And I was so used to praying with white students. And, uh, and I love praying with folks anyway, but <laughs> white students in university and other, you know, they just kind of pray different. Like, Lord, um, thank you for the breeze. And yeah. um, thank you for the squirrels and the trees. And I know I'm being facetious, but um, yeah. you know, I love my white people. I got to laugh about that. That's how we pray. Because black people don't pray like that. We, we, we trying to get the rent paid. Yeah. <laughs> we can't talk about squirrels and crap. And, uh, and so when I went to that Korean uh, fellowship, I closed my eyes. Those folks were like, Father God, we need you today. Come in this place. There's no other name like you. There's no other name under the sun whereby we must be saying, come Jesus. Come. I had to open my eyes. So I felt like I was transported <laughs> off that campus That's right. to a black Pentecostal prayer meeting. Right. Right. Opening up my eyes. I was like, what the heaven? Yep. Who are y'all? Mm-hmm. And how did you get the Black Holy Spirit? That's right. That's right. What did that happen? I didn't see that in the textbook. <laughs> and so that was the beginning for me years ago, about about many of the uh, about many of the, the the similarities. But you're right. As we as we begin to talk and lean into each other, it makes us more in tune. Because I know once I went to to Korea, and I and I was able to take I received a grant too. So I was able to take my wife and my daughter. Yep. Sister was there also. But after we came back, I remember the very next Olympics, or was it the World Cup? It was a big sporting event. Mm-hmm. And I was in another room, and Lexi said, hey, Dan, come here, come here. Our people are playing. Our people are playing. So I yeah. remember thinking it was like U.S. <laughs> or yeah. Africa. 
I went in there, it was South Korea. <laughs> She's like, Dad, our people are playing, our people are playing. That's right. Um, or when uh, North Korea was launching um, um, test missiles, launch, you know, towards mm-hmm. South Korea. I listened with different ears. Um, there was a ferry accident near Jeju Island. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. I'd been there. So yep. when I heard that, I was immediately tuned in because I knew that region. Yeah. And I met people there. And that's a beautiful yeah. spot. And um, we can't just be connected intellectually. We've got to get into relationships yep. with each other. And Peter, one of the things I appreciate about you is that you'll do that. You won't just wait for Black people to come to you. Um, you know, you participate in Black, in, um, I'm going to say Black Friday, in Good Friday <laughs> service. In Black yeah. church community, Holy Week is a very, is a very sacred oh, yeah. There's a tradition called the Seven Last Words of Jesus, yep. where seven preachers. It's like a preaching fest. It's like yeah. a, you know... But you participated in it and you yeah. bring your church to that and there's work you're doing in Inglewood and not just in Asian American communities, but in places where other folks aren't wanting to work. And, and so for me, what I've appreciated about our friendship is that you've been intentional about building those cross-cultural relationships. You've taken your son, your daughters, your wife, and your mom to Africa. Yeah. This isn't just the Peter on show, but and you've taken leaders from your church and you've helped Asian Americans, Korean Americans fall in love with, with, you know, with, with Africa. Like when I went, you know, I was the only black person in our group, but you know, we've gone a couple of times where I found that some of the South Africans knew people from your church yeah. better than they knew me. They're like, yeah. Hey, Mama Zuma. And they're hugging and stuff. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Oh, this is my motherland. And you all know it better. Like they knew the <laughs> customs and the food and where to do and where to take your shoes off. That kind of exchange makes us better. Yeah. And, and stronger. So this isn't a time to be looking back and, and, and keeping keeping score, um, if communities of color bring our collective strength and beauty in, in, in a way of honoring our, our ancestors in where they couldn't. My great-great-grandmother probably would have never kicked it with your great-great-grandfather. That's right. But we're in a different time. We do, and our children do, and we've got to really work together because there's a strength in that level of unity, and there's a demand that we can make on denominations, yep. banks, entertainment, Yep. as we begin to work together. And so I want folks who are listening to understand that we've got to lean into this. And there's room for whites in this too. So it's not just us against, we really have to be, yeah. just become a stronger humanity. But because we were strategically pitted against each other, we've got to dig through the, ar- the, through the archives to even find that Asian Americans found direction and light for their own liberty in this country yeah. based upon what they were watching Black people do and if we help get this word out to people i think we'll embrace each other differently when we see each other yeah absolutely you know so one of the groups that i love being a part of is that years ago um just because of my connections with some of you know the black pastors in my neighborhood in our neighborhood and and the korean pastors we decided to come together as a group and just kind of form a, a black korean pastors kind of gathering where we connect there on a monthly basis and it's been really cool and uh, I remember, I think it was like the, probably the third or the fourth meeting when we had, uh, that we had uh, one, of, one of the Korean pastors, actually, she said something that was really cool. She said, I feel like whenever we get together, we're giving the middle finger to the white establishment. And, uh, and, and that's really what it was. And then what's really cool is that it's been about, about three, four, four years now since this group has been together. And it's just real great organic relationships of friendships that's been sure. forming. Uh, people are going fishing together. People are going golfing together, and they're oh connecting. And the biggest thing is we're learning about each other's cultures, and uh, and and really asking questions that we've never been able to ask. You know, Korean Korean pastors are able to ask Black pastors certain questions. And I remember sure. one guy, one of the Korean pastors says, "Are you guys okay if we call you Black? You know, because you know, you know, I'm Korean American. I'm not Asian American. I'm Korean American. So you know, and just things like that. And right. it's, it's just these kinds of questions that no one's ever able to." to kind of ask and stuff and just having a safe place to ask it and also sharing about what discrimination was like for us in America. And I remember a group of back black pastors were looking at each other and like, oh, Asian people suffer too. I didn't know Asian people suffered in this right, country. Right. And so just that kind of relationship and talking about things like that and having those kinds of conversations has been really important. And, and, and to see the, the mutuality and the support that we're showing each other through this group has been really cool. So. Sure. Yeah. Do you do you know? Um, well, how did you talk to your children? You have a daughter in college. Um, your middle daughter is is an upperclassman now yeah. in high school, and then your son will be going. No, he's in high school. 
No, he's no, in eighth grade. He's eighth grade. He'll be in high school next year. Yep. How, how do you how do you talk to them about what's happening for folks of Asian descent? Because you've worked hard, you know, you're you're in a doctoral program, you've got advanced, you have an advanced degree, you you traveled the world. I mean, you and I sort of believe that some of this was behind us. Yeah. How do you now prepare your son um, for the harsh reality of your painful childhood, childhood of being made fun of? I mean, you thought that was behind you. How do you, yeah. do you talk to them about how to navigate these crazy times while maintaining a strong sense of self, identity, and, and, and a beautiful culture? Yeah, you know, I would say that for um, my, my, my two kids that are in school here in this town, you know, Leonia, the one benefit we have is that, you know, the town that we live in, it's, uh, I think it's like 55% Korean. Um, oh, so is it? Okay. It's, 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 so they, they go to school, they don't feel like a minority. They actually feel like the majority. Wow. Sure. And so it's a very different experience. Uh, my, my, now, my daughter goes to college and um, it's, diff- it's a different experience up there even though there is a large Asian community there, you know, at Rutgers, but, but nonetheless, it's still a much larger community. And so it's very different, but my, my, my daughter, Christina, um, is, is really, in, is, she's really all about social justice. And, um, and it's right. interesting because she just said, you know, dad, I'm, I'm not going to be a part of, um, like just an, like, I think they're fine, but she said, I'm not going to be a part of Korean Christian groups. I want to be a part of, uh, groups that are diverse and I want, I, you know, and so she's a part of university. And she's a part of another Christian group called Alpha Omega and stuff. And she just, she's constantly looking for more diversity because I guess for her, that's a big part of who she is and what she's experienced at her school and stuff like that. And she sees the beauty of it. And I guess she sees kind of how I live my life and how that's I have beautiful. folks from different, you know, like you and other people. And she realizes that's really important to her. And so she's really, uh, she's really adamant about that. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing, but we do have discussions because, you know, I, 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 I tell my my kids, particularly Kayla and Christian, I just said what you were experiencing here is very different than what typical Asians experience around this country, because you live in a place where there's so much, so many Asian people that it's really hard sure. for you to fully get a grasp of what it's like to be discriminated upon based upon the color of your skin. Uh, but it will come a time where you will experience that. But at the end, just you always need to know who you are, stand up for yourself the best you can. And, uh, and always look to others to help you. Because I think with Asians is that whenever we experience any type of, you know, uh, abuse at any level, um, our, our typical response is be quiet about it. Be silent. You know, we're, we're very passive aggressive people and we don't like to share bad things that's happened to us because part of it's shame, you know, and mm. stuff like that as well. Because so you've worked hard and it shouldn't happen. Yeah, we don't want to talk about it. We don't, we don't like attention being brought to us when stuff like this happens. But I just tell them that communication is so important. You need to communicate with us, you know, me as your father and, uh, and people that, are, that you're close with and that you cannot go through hardships alone. So wow. we talk about that, yeah. You know, it's interesting, Peter, that this flip for the black people. We're like, oh, hell no. Let me call the newspaper. NAACP, yeah. Yeah. like when stuff happens. And, so- and that's what we need to learn from. We need to learn from the, black, from, from the black community about how do we stand up? Because Asian community, we're just quiet about it. We don't, wanna, we, we don't want people to notice us. And so how, how do we stand up? And I think it's happening now and more people are, are trying, but I think there's so much we can learn from the black community. How do we do this? We've got to come together to do that. Yeah. Because if, 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 let's just say those who don't like to bring attention to their pain because it's a source of shame, then as we are, as we are you know, voice these, these outcries, yep. we might be looked at with some shame or just damn it, like, look at them making noise. It might, I, I don't know, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it might be perceived as it couldn't be that bad or come on, could everybody really yep. be doing that against them? Yep. yep. So it's going to be hard for you to voice your way, to voice yourself in that way. If you think we're bringing attention to ourselves and bringing shame to what we're doing. And if we just shut up and put as much energy into working hard, these things wouldn't happen to us. It's hard for you all to take on, you know, on that, on that, you know, on that posture. Yeah. Um, but I think, um, working together to help people come out of the sense of shame. Because if you're suffering silently, mm. that's how it's able to continue. Think about, yeah. we're pastors. We talk to people in abusive marriages, whose children, children who are being abused. And people say, we didn't know because they present like it's so yeah. powerful. But you and I have talked to enough of those folks to find out the physical beating is one thing. The name calling is another. The silence and the secrecy 
yeah. is what kills. Because once That's the beating right. stops, the bruises heal, you still have that shroud of shame that yeah. makes you think you deserve it. So you never That's really right. expect That's right. the best. And so I think part of what we got what we got to be able to do is to um to speak out when we're having that sense of pain. Yeah, and, and I, I would say with the Asian community too, what's interesting is that, you know, we grew up idolizing whiteness. I was wondering about this and, and how so, identity was shaped. Um, I, I think for us, it's, it's, you know, and to experience discrimination upon those that we've idolized, um, there's a sense of deeper shame that we mm -hmm. experience and, and a deeper sense of we should be more quiet about this than more vocal about it. And so I, th I think it's, it's great now that, you know, there are folks, you know, like our friends, like Sun Chan Ra and others too, that are really like, you know, Peter Cha and others that are leading the way and helping us and, and the older folks that are helping the younger folks. How do we do this the best way? And, and the great thing about the younger Asian community is that they ain't going to stand for it. They're going to, they're going to take a stand. And these are third generation Korean Americans, you know, second generation Korean Americans that, that are now saying, no, we're going to take a stand. And this is the time where I think, the black community and the Korean community and the Asian community should come together and really learn and collaborate and come together. Cause if we can do that, the power I think, and, and um, what we can do together in this country for social justice, I think could be pretty remarkable. It can be very, it can yeah. be historic. You know, I was in a training once at a, at a seminary and an, an older African American gentleman was making the point that I had made that we need other ethnic groups to understand the work, the mission, the call of African Americans, not to point the finger at us and put the spotlight on us, but to say we're more united than we think. So this is not necessarily a new journey. Let's just go back to a place where we've, mm. where we've been, that the, we've created the roadmap. Um, and the white facilitator said, well, hold it, hold it. Let's not get into, you know, the pain Olympics. <clears throat> and she used that word. And when she did, it triggered my group. It triggered me, my mm. sister, and others in the group. Mm. There's a white woman, a white man in my group. It triggered us. And I raised my hand and I said, white people have built the pain, have built the racial Olympic stadium. Now you're telling us not to race in it. You built that stadium to race us against yeah. each other. Yeah. Now you're going to say, hold it, hold it, hold it. Let's not have the pain Olympics. Yeah. And, um, and so we have to become very conscious of the fact that this is not just black and white. Yeah. That other groups have been hurting, have been hurting as well. But a lot of the laws that have created this systemic oppression were created by whites. And the folks who rose up together because of a 400 year history in this country were African-American people to open the door for everyone in between. Mm -hmm. So I also wanna help people to understand that when we talk about race relations, it's not just about blacks and whites. Um, I think black people have been trying to bring down the systemic oppression by whites. Yeah. I think we have to even shift our paradigm and our approach to greater collaboration with, Af with, with Asian Americans and others mm -hmm. Because rather than just asking the white power structure, and for my, for, my, for my white people, my allies, my Black Like Me podcast family, we're not talking about people of European descent. We're talking about systems built by a sense of whiteness, yes. cultural construct. If you're new to season four, go back to season one, begin to listen to these discussions. But the systemic racism that was set up yeah. for whiteness so that people of European descent did not have to say, I'm Irish. Um, I'm Czech, I'm yeah. German, I'm Scandinavian. They could be white, yep. gain acceptance, and just move towards greater, um, to a greater power grab. Yes. And so we're trying to break down that construct, that white construct, so that others can come in. Maybe black people have been putting in too much, too much emphasis on trying to break that white nut. Maybe we need to connect up with Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, and build Latino, Native American, and build yep. a stronger coalition so that together we can say, um, we're gonna come together to come against this enemy and we're gonna bring it down. So I, so I just want people to, people to understand that, that African-American people don't think that others don't have issues, but because we don't talk, yeah. we don't know that they do. It really was when, when that letter came out that I said, whoa, this is serious. And, and, and because our ears are tuned into different parts yeah. of the news. You and I know each other, so I know about, yep. of course, I know about structural racism and how it affects Korean Americans. Yep. But I also know you live in Leonia, like, like yep. where you said, the school districts are predominantly Korean American. Yep. When we go, it's very easy to find um, Korean American, Chinese American yep. restaurants, businesses, um, grocery stores. We, I go, I see yep. that when they're there. I, I'd never see that where I live. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but but it, it, until I knew you, I didn't realize that there's a history of some of that systemic oppression. 
And so I bet you a lot of Asian Americans who are experiencing this and weren't prepped for it are really reeling. And so when that letter came out saying, stand with us in solidarity, I just thought, this is really bad yeah. because now other groups are being picked out. And if you yeah. can do that to the minority group, that really puts all of us yes, right. at a different level of risk. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let's, let's, let's find a way to, 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 to find some good out of this. And it's exactly right. what you said. Like, you know, it's one of the gifts I think that you have as well is that you're able to, to cr uh, cross culturally connect with any ethnic group. And I feel like that's, that's what we have to do. We have to figure out a way to where we can all just come together uh, build authentic relations with each other and also figure out ways where we can come together and really be one voice in this and not just different voices coming at it at all different ways. But if we're unified and we have that one voice and we can speak into this um, and, and to the power structures that continue in this country and speak against it, I think that could really be powerful. And something there could be a new day. Right. Right. I think, in a this country. very new day. Yeah. And, and yeah. Peter, you and I know that we have work to do in our communities. We have work to do in our political systems. But we also have work to do in our churches. Yes. Because the American church was shaped by whiteness, by yep. white identity, a European Everything. mindset. Yep. Some of what we've inherited is almost biblically based. Yes. Erroneously. Yes. And theologically, um, that we need to keep our separateness. That you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's why our churches are so segregated. It's why it's right. Multi ethnicity is very tough to find, and it is very hard. To, to you know to to maintain so our work is not just limited to society and our children's schools it's a we church really we really have to help the church to do yeah. this because there's an ideology that the church thinks is a christian mindset yeah. that really plays out into patriotism nationalism that hurts people in this country i mean right. you know and i'm not i'm not trying to use this code to say people shouldn't vote for trump i mean come on i'm 56 i voted republican and yeah. democrat over the course of my life i'm not a yeah. car carrying anything but what we're seeing in this country this rise of mm -hmm. division and hatred and fear and and all of these things it's very it's very very frightening and this couldn't continue this level of racial division this administration could not be fed without the church the christian right. church could shut this crap down just like it could have it could have shut internment right. camps down That's it right. could have it could have shut slavery down but it chose not to because the church the American church is really code for whiteness and it's yes. an economic and a political and a national need at the risk of what I think is a true biblical agenda. And actually, I think we can vote out a current administration, a current president and see signs of, of healing. There is no election for evangelical Christianity. There is no election for the general church. Yeah. So the work we've got to do to see true change in our denomination in the in the in the in the in the church with Big C, that's that's a tall order also. So what you and I are talking about is like a lifelong battle. And I think because yeah. the church has not wrestled with it, I think a lot of people who are listening to this have not seen the church as relevant because we were silent while yeah. all of these divisions were supported. And the media makes it very clear that it's folks who could sit in our pews or sit in the pews of our colleagues that are voting yeah. these folks in that are doing these kinds of things. So we've got a lot of work to do, but it begins with a conversation like this. Yeah. It begins with white folks saying, you know, when you hear your friends talking about not just black people, but Asian folks and what they're doing and what they're bringing here and all of these kinds of things, if you're going to be an ally, you got to shut it down. We're not just yeah. training allies to understand the black reality, black people did what they did so we could all be free. That's black right. people, black slaves even wanted the children of white slave owners to be free. Mm -hmm. They saw the system. Many of them saw the system for what it was. It's why many of the black people, when they would sneak out and have those all-night prayer meetings while enslaved, they prayed for the children of those slave owners, that they would have a change of heart. And I believe the abolitionists and those folks who, who were raised up was because Black people prayed and were able, and they were people of faith and could show love in the midst of such um, ugly hatred that I yeah. think began to turn this thing around. So we've got to pray, we got to talk, we got to build meaningful relationships with, with each other. And this discussion is to help particularly folks who are not of Asian descent to understand 
that when any of our Asian American brothers and sisters are suffering in this way, it's an affront to all of us and to white folks. You need to understand that it further distances us from, from you. So we all have a part in bringing some resolution to this. So if you have not signed that covenant, I'm gonna put a link on it yeah. in, this, in, this, um, um, in the notes section of this. And do what Peter and I have done. I went into a Korean American yeah. context. Peter went into Africa in an African American context among African American pastors. Don't tell me this, we don't know where they are. Listen, white folks, y'all right. have been to the moon. Y'all have built ships to go to Africa and to go to Asia. You all can do what you put your minds to. You can find who you want to find if you think it's a value. Yeah. White people go all the way to Africa to find blood diamonds. White folks are very innovative. Black people, we're very um, persistent. Let's stop saying that they're not in our community, they're not in our schools. That's because we've been separated. Go find these meaningful relationships or this crap is gonna be even harder for your children. Yeah. I, I, I almost feel like uh, the church is a lot darker than the world is with this and when it comes Ooh. to race and Ooh. race relations. Come on it's now. A, it's a lot darker than the world. I think the world is really taking um, a step forward uh, but when you look at the church and look at what the church is like here in America, I mean, it's still so divided by race and it's really sad. There's a darkness. There's a real deep darkness here. And I guess I would just, the, the only thing I would say to, to maybe the, the, your white listeners, and I'm so grateful that they're listening because I think a lot of them are just so woke and, and they realize what's going on. But I think what's really important is, is uh, for white folks is that they can't be too afraid to release power. To, to minorities, to black people, to, to Asian people, to, right, to Latino right. people. Because, you know, I think the thing that, that bothers me even more sometimes, the explicit racism, I expect. But right. I think there's implicit racism when white people want to control the diversity in their organization. And, uh, and then they kind of get... preach. Come they on. Get, they, get their, <laughs> they get their minority people that they want so that they look like they're very diverse and they are, and they're ethnic and they're, you know, woke with this situation. But it's not, you're not fully woke until you're able to release the power and actually lean on it. So I, for, for our church, I really respect tremendously the white folks in our, in our community. Because for them to submit themselves to Asian American, to African American leadership in our church, to me, it's remarkable that they would be right. willing to do that. Not too many white people would be willing to do that. We don't see that a lot. No, we don't. And so, and so I think that is, you know, maybe some people listening is that maybe it's, maybe, and if you're a Christian, maybe it's time that you stop going to a white church. Maybe it's time you go to a church where it's more predominantly black, predominantly uh, Latino, predominantly Asian American, and submit yourself to the leadership there and grow right. from it. Right. And, and don't I think that could it. be a really great step. And teach your kids that this is important. Right. Yeah. And that is a, not as a field trip. Don't just do it yeah. for two weeks and say, that's fun. No. You become no. a member of the church. Right. Because that's what we do. That's what we've had. That's what we've had to, to do. Um, you know, you're saying some really, some really powerful things, Peter, that we have to, um, this is the time for, for a real big shakeup for first have real discussions. And so I want to say, um, you know, to our white listeners, lean in. If you're part of a, a diversity initiative, and the extent of the diversity is whether or not your last name ends in S-O-N or S-E-N. <laughs> That's not the kind of diversity we're talking about. Um, multinational organizations are having discussions. I have friends who work in the diversity and inclusion areas. They're saying, well, diversity can also be the diversity of thought. Um, so we need people who are Republican and Democrat. We're moving the discussion away from um, ethnic diversity cultural diversity and we're making it diversity of thought and again this is nothing against their gender diversity etc yeah. we're not speaking against that but people are taking diversity where they really want it to go so if you're an hr professional or you know an hr professional share this episode yeah but if there are minority think tanks and groups and it uh, uh to talk about diversity and nobody on it uh are people of color wrong er, stop it yeah. or resign from it because if you don't you're perpetuating the issue yep. you and this this problem you got it you got to continue to just to just stop this stuff another thing i am personally tired of white organizations that want to understand diversity so they pay white people to talk to them about black people mm. and then once they pay tens of thousands of dollars yep. they call black people and ask for free advice 
Mm. White people will pay white people to talk to them about people of color and then call people of color and ask for mm. a free gimme, a free yeah. handout. Can you tell us some people in your church? Can you tell us some people in your family? Can you refer? Can you get us some customers, clients, potential yeah. lenders? I mean, borrowers. So listen. And how is that um, not racism? How is that's that not racism. racism? Yeah, yeah. You pass money to other white organizations. Yeah. Well, okay, when they come to you, do they bring any people of color? Yeah. And if they do, yeah. are they in leadership? Yeah. And have they struggled, structured this? If you were trying to hire an accountant, you would not hire a firm that can't count. Yeah, yeah. That does not, does, that does not have good um, um, audits. You wouldn't do that. But yet you'll hire an organization to tell you how to treat black and Asian people. And they don't have a single black or Asian folk person on their professional team, maybe in the kitchen, maybe with a mop or mm -hmm. broom. Come on, white people. You all are in positions where you're shaping the HR agenda. Reach out. That's right. Peter on can consult right. you. I can consult yeah. you. We've got team. We got staff. And even with this social distancing, we can do it over line. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we can do it online. But please stop that foolishness of having white people try to tell you how to diversify. Let me tell you, diversity is a lot of work if you do it right. Mm -hmm. And if they've got a lot of time on their hands with big so that they can talk to you about it, they're probably not doing it. Yeah. So, right. um, man, Peter, anything right. else before we leave? I know we're no, over man. our time a little it's bit. It's great. No, it's great. It's great to be here and to talk about this. So thanks for having me on. This is man, great. And I have appreciated our friendship and our families um, getting to know each other. Um, um, you know, even in the good and the bad. You know, my yeah. mom has memory issues, but you've yeah. gone with me to her nursing facility. Yeah. Um, you almost, you know, you almost had to help me break up a fight. Uh, <laughs> she still got that West Side Chicago. She hasn't right. forgotten that. That's you right. know, she might not know what day it is, uh, but she know what time it is. You don't mess with Mama G. You don't mess with Mama G. <laughs> you don't mess you with her, mess, yeah. Mama G. And now that filter's gone, and that church mother cusses now. <laughs> Oh yeah, they they call now they call her Verlene the Queen. They call her Verlene the Queen. <laughs> she is now the sec. He has the second um, uh, in terms of tenure. She's she's been there. Uh, she's number two in terms of longevity. All right. yeah, yeah. So she has to run. She has to run that place. But I love the fact that you know your mom speaks very little uh, yeah. English. But when she sees me, she'll run and hug me. I think is it? Oh yeah, Moksani. Mok Moksani. Yeah. Am I saying yeah. that right? Yeah, Moksani. you are. Yeah. Um, which is a Korean word for pastor. Yep. And um, um, and I know she's a woman of prayer, so I often will ask you, hey, how's mama on? Ask her to pray for me. How's she doing this COVID-19 stuff? So I just want people to know this didn't happen overnight. Yes. Um, we met each other while hanging out in a very small group yep. of, um, of blacks and Asians, maybe a sprinkling yep. of whites. Um, I was one of two black, black people in the very first session, but we kept in touch over the years and very intentional. So um, we're not saying, hey, look at us, we're a model, yep. but we're saying, um, you know, we live about 800, 800 miles away from each other, yep. but we make sure we talk, that we visit, we'll take trips together, um, we'll do pulpit exchanges. Yep. If you really want this, you got to be intentional. And so white people don't expect folks to ship people of color to your house like they're an Amazon product. Mm -hmm. Get up out your, oh, they're going to mm -hmm. be delivered by, by drone. Go yep. to a church, go to an organization, celebrate stuff and lean in because it makes you better. You're not doing black people a favor, Korean people a favor by showing up and saying, see, I'm not even freaked out. No, do it because you need it. And so um, my very special guest has been my buddy, my brother, Peter Chung Kun An. That's right. Because um, you know, that's why I love to call you because that's what your mom and daddy called you. you, you they call, you, they call you're the only non-Korean person. Actually, you're the only other person outside of my immediate family that calls me Chunga. My wife doesn't even call me that, but you call me by my Korean name, Chunga. Man, when I t you know, when you call me, that comes up on my phone. Yes, because, right. Because I'm thinking, you know, I want to speak to the soul That's right. of, uh, uh, you know, who you are. So, man, hey, I appreciate this time. Let's keep this dialogue going. I'm going to put the link for, um, uh, for signing that petition here. And I just want my Asian American brothers and sisters to know that just like you stood with us in solidarity back to um, the 1950s and 60s and even before that, that black people, at least this black person and the people I know, we're gonna stand with you in solidarity because this is unconscionable. We're not gonna sit back and let this happen. And uh, we're not gonna let this nation suppress um, our beauty, our strength, our culture, and what we bring to truly make this country mm -hmm. um, strong and powerful without us it's going to be just a big, yeah. hot mess. And so America needs us.
and um, and so we're gonna we're gonna help each other. So um, I just want you and your family Thank to you. stay safe. We jump right into yes. the discussion, but I'm just trusting that you all are safe, yeah. Peter. That yep, you're yep. Really we're all good. Well. Yep, your mom's doing well. Everyone's good. Thank you. Good. Yep. And they've got mom's facility locked down, so she's doing well. I'm taking us some collard greens this afternoon. There you go. Uh, yeah, because you know nursing home food is not. Yeah. You know, they got a black cook, but she can only cook what they got in the kitchen. They don't, have, they don't have collard greens. No, I'm sure they don't have collard greens, especially not your kind of collard greens. Not my collard No, 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 no. no. My, my, my mother and I put a foot in it, and that's going to yes, be a right. whole nother black like the icebreaker. You know what that means. That's right. So, man, take care. Listen, you all, this has been another powerful and exciting episode of Black Like Me podcast. And as I do each week, um, I want to challenge you to listen, to lean in, to learn. If something struck you, um, uh, in a unique way, rewind it and listen to it again and, and be transformed by it and do something. What can you do? You can share this episode and don't share with your Asian American friends just to prove that you know something about them. Unless you think, unless you have a real relationship to share with them, but share with your white friends, share with folks, share with everybody, everybody just share this. But particularly if you know people that have been impacted by this rise of xenophobia and this, this new stuff that's been happening to Asian Americans. I don't know if it's true. I got a fact check. I've even heard that gun sales among Asian Americans have increased. Mm. Um, there's just a sense of a need for protection. Yep. Asian American folks are hiring white people to go grocery shopping for them because if they go into a store with a mask, they're afraid of being assaulted. This yep. is cr- what year is this, people? Yeah. So, white folks who are listening who want to be allies, black people, it's not our time to gloat. Let's lean in. Let's call our Asian American friends, Korean American friends, Chinese American friends. Let's check in on people. Let's find out how they're doing and let's let them know that. Um, with a greater sense of solidarity, we can lean into this. Click the link to go to Patreon so that you can support this work so we can continue to get these messages and episodes out. Subscribe, 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 post, retweet. Help us to get this word out. I so appreciate you being a part of the Black Like Me podcast family. You all have a great day and please continue to be safe. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holliday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Mm -hmm.